Subject to Change, a sustainability podcast. I'm Lauren Stanek. I'm Jody Smith Anderson. And welcome to Subject to Change. And today, our awesome guest is TJ Mannix. Welcome to a conversation with TJ Mannix. I feel like artists aren't appreciated as much as they should be by mm-hmm. certain people. Um, without artists, <laughs> where does the culture go? Right. Artists, uh, artists that's, are that's innovators. Huge. They're the creative. They are the. I, and unfortunately, right now in 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 the in the world in 2020, artists are also penniless and homeless more than they usually are. <laughs> I know it's the because <laughs> we can joke about it, but yeah, don't, it's the first thing that gets dropped. But it's the thing that's the only thing that keeps us actually human is the arts. Mm-hmm. And, and look at the history. See I which know cultures folded when they got rid of the arts. Yeah, that's that's a it's a a call to a call of attention to to state that out loud. And uh, and I'm, I'm glad you said it. I think art allows you to understand that that different is not bad. <laughs> different yeah. is actually celebratory and beneficial to almost to everything we do. Right. You know, and, and you that's, look at that's... look at television. You look at television and movies. You know the fact that they may be behind the curve, but it, it... Lucille Ball and Ricky Ricardo oh my God, had, I know. Twin, had twin beds as a married couple, and they didn't have a bathroom. Eventually, <laughs> that's right. They didn't have a bathroom. Eventually, we had a couple that had a bed, and amazing how that changed lives around the world. How many couples were infertile and they didn't know why? <laughs> <laughs> LGBTQ representation yeah. in film and television. Looking at looking at uh, oh look that is that is a black leading man. Yeah. Or or looking Shocker. at someone someone and you say oh my god I saw I saw me out in the world for the first time, right. and that might keep me from. From losing myself my, or in, taking my own life yeah you know there's an yeah. incredible power that artists have and yeah and uh uh you know fascists know that that's why they shut it all down that's why they you shut know? it down absolutely learn more at actorsfund.org but the actors fund it doesn't just deal with actors what it is it's, it's an organization that has been supporting people in the arts mm-hmm. for for years and years, they have they have buildings that they've created for actors who for 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 older actors that that can't afford you know that would be homeless otherwise. Right, right. There are so it's actorsfund.org, um, and the actors fund is it it helps with healthcare. Um, they have a they have a free clinic for professional actors who very often can't afford insurance. Um, they have. They have a program where every actor can get one pair of shoes. That's the amazing. Simple things that go by the wayside. And um, so I, I, I am a firm believer in what the Actors Fund does. They help out with medical care. They help out with insurance. They help out with housing for people that lose yeah. their housing. But they also do it not just for actors. It's for stage managers and for uh, lighting designers. It's people within the business. It's also for your your choir teacher in Minneapolis, and it's for the, the 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 piano player at at that bar in San Diego. Yeah. You know, it's for it's for artists. So the Actors Fund is something that I think a lot of people ask. Well, what can I do if I'm okay and maybe I have ten dollars I can give or a hundred dollars I can give? The Actors yeah. Fund has been around for a really long time, and what they do is. I've benefited from it, so I give to them. Let's make oh. it the social safety nets that we need so that we can have a society that excels and grows and innovates and is is free from the base cares so they can do the valuable work that they need to do. A, a society that takes care of its most vulnerable members. Yeah. It's like, it's like growing up and like letting your infant child fend for itself. Yeah. That's not good parenting. Objectification. This Marilyn Monroe movie 
uh, call. Oh God, I forget what it is. Seven year age. No. Gentlemen it's the prefer one... blondes. No. It's the you one where she's in, so. in love with a Frenchman. Oh, honey, I shrunk the kids. No. She's... Anyway, she's an actor and she's in love with this Frenchman and he's rich and it's a very interesting little movie but there's she says that 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 she finds people very interesting because she can walk through the dressing room wearing nothing but her good intentions and nobody will say a thing but she goes out into the real world and she can't even be dressed well and not get pinched by everybody that's that's the most theater that's, that's theater but there's also, there's still a power structure. There's still asshole yes. old white dudes with money who think I'm going to do this just so I can get a little. Producers. Hello, Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, Death no, to kidding. Harvey Weinstein. It's so it, sad that you're crumbling, but it's because you have no heart. There were to, I took painstaking, painstaking parameters to make sure that I was not dressing a certain way or acting a certain way or whatever especially in my 20s and then into my 30s and in construction management i'm sure it's a thing well in 20s and 30s there was definitely some amount of that that took place that i did have to report and it very much went unfounded and now so i'm like a handful of days into my 40s and i said to my mom she's upset i feel like this is my time to yeah. be attractive and she said well, what do you mean and I said well I wasn't allowed to be attractive in my 20s and she said oh. how do you mean and I said if I I wasn't allowed to be attractive in my 20s because in my 20s I would be sexually harassed and I wasn't allowed to oh. be attractive in my 30s because in my 30s I was in a long-term relationship oh my god and so now I feel like at 40 I'm finally allowed allowed take that in to be attractive because it's okay for me to stand up to objectification. It's okay hmm. for me to say, you're not allowed to say that to me. So I'm allowed to be 40 and attractive at this point. I'm allowed to be 40 and kind of own my sexuality for the first time in my entire life. Well, kudos for you in your 40s. And I'm really sorry for the woman in your 20s and 30s that you were because it sucks to have to judge yourself from with the eyes of everyone around you. Continual improvement. I am very lucky in that I, the few times I've experienced any kind of restriction based on my sex, I actually called the person on it. And it, in one case, it was, it was a job thing and it was remedied and they, they back dated my pay and brought me up eight thousand dollars because of the discrepancy wow. because i brought it to their attention i've never heard of anything like that i am slow clapping oh my god bacon i'm clapping with you like <laughs> no that, that was awesome it was because my my taking it to power was well are you sure i have been yeah. called out for talking over a female friend and who said that I, I absolutely crushed her and belittled her where I thought that I was, she had said that she liked that I can summarize things. And that's why she asked me to work on this critical conversation series. And she, yeah, she said I, uh, she, she almost threw up because she felt like I had disrespected her so much. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. Like I said, I'm totally a work in progress. What is my value? What is my value here? You have the right to, to define your own value and be it. But it's, it just wears you down when the world around you does not, does not acknowledge your own perception of your value. And I, I absolutely get that. And the world quite often is that way when your looks are part of your value. So if I'm an actress, let's twist this. If yeah. I'm an actress, if I'm in a musical, if I'm in some sort, if I'm in Broadway, if I'm in a musical, if I'm in you know, some sort of live show where I would argue, and please TJ, correct me if I'm wrong, my 
physical well-being is so much a part of what I bring to the table. How do you bring that to the table on a daily basis and feel like you have a voice and you can be authentic and you can stand up to me too and you can stand up to people who have billions, millions, millions, billions, it doesn't matter of dollars when I barely have two nickels to rub together. Yesterday, I gave my class uh, a pamphlet from SAG-AFTRA, which is the union for the actors. Mm -hmm. I gave them this pamphlet, which says, um, let me see if I can find it real quick, just so I say the right title for it. But basically what this pamphlet did was it said, here are your rights when you're doing a scene that involves intimacy or modesty garments. If you're ever in a position where someone tries to flip the script and change the rules and say that now, after you've already signed a contract, they're going to add something, you need to know, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to any one of your other teachers that you trust and call us at three o'clock in the morning and say, what the hell do I do? And know that we care enough and that good performers care about their community and care about their fellow actors and made, making sure that they're protected. Um, Michelle Hurd did a, a, a seminar. She's a phenomenal. I don't know if you ever, if you saw Picard on CBS, mm -hmm. she plays Picard's buddy the one who has the alcohol problem and who is like, she's just- Yeah, she's amazing. She's so actually. amazing, I know. Uh, she had to do a love scene for a TV show called Younger. She did a love scene that was in a bathtub. <gasps> I know this scene. Yeah. So she showed up at her trailer and she had arranged ahead of time and she said, I will provide my own modesty garments. Meaning they can provide you with pasties, which are like things that will cover your nipples and your areolas. Yeah. Uh, they also can provide you with a patch that will cover your genital area. She said, I'm okay with that. I have a, something that is skin tone that is cloth that is like a band, yeah. like a tube top. And she said, and I also have, I'm going to wear biker shorts. Yeah. Because okay. I'm in the water. Yeah. yeah. So to clarify, I'm wearing biker shorts. Mm -hmm. She showed up and wardrobe had laid out pasties and a patch. And she said, what's this for? And they said, well, uh, th th she was wondering, they were like wondering, well, when are you going to put them on? And she said, oh, I've already made the arrangement for what I was yeah. wearing. And they were like, well, I mean, those are there for you. They're for you. So you can just go ahead and put those on. And she said, no. So she put on what she wanted, but she did the entire scene. And then when they ended, three people ran up to Debbie Mazar with a robe when she got out of the water, threw the robe over her and brought her back to her dressing room and they left Michelle in the water. Ugh. They didn't take care of her. No, there's so, a death. She sat there for a moment and said, these people are expecting me to step out of this on my own and walk mm -hmm. back to my trailer. And Debbie yeah. Mazar turned around and said, what the hell are you doing? Someone get her a robe. Good, good. And you needed somebody in power to make that yeah. statement. That it, I think it's as much the power structure as the male female thing. The times that I've had the, the biggest issues in, in, in my work environment have been because of women bosses who were so defensive of their position that any any time, and, and this is also in, in the theater in, in theater world, I had a director a female director who's a, a friend of mine that we're not speaking right now because it just got to the point where whenever she was a director any question from me as an actor she took as an attack on her on her vision for the play as opposed wow. to me trying to figure out how to do the best job with the role that I could mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so these women at at DASNY my day job um, they were women in position of power and I worked for them, but if I asked a question, it was immediately, um, it was immediately their def their defense mechanism kicked in. They, they they insulted me. They undermined me. They created positions where I was doing grunt work, um, and and it was just 
it totally threw me because when people ask me questions, all right, when I have a really bad day, I might react defensively. And then the next day I'm like, holy crap, I acted defensively. I'm sorry, you asked me a question. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I'm like really excited when people care enough to ask a question. It's, it's, it's supportive when somebody asks a question. Like um, the only time she paid me a compliment was when I had, I had actually lost 10 pounds and I was wearing a dress that I had never worn before that was very form fitting, which was very unlike me. And she went out of her way to compliment me on my attire. Mm -hmm. All the work that I had done for the previous year and a half, she had never complimented me on. She had, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. Absolute power. And I would say that having experienced the the Spitzer administration, I was hired because of the Spitzer administration. He was like a decent guy until he got power. And then he was like, oh my God, I can get away with all this shit. Yep. And and what is that? What does that mean? Common story. I think that that's a common thread, don't you, TJ? You would neglect your awesome responsibility. Do you think you would abuse your awesome power and maybe lord it over the lesser minions? Um, I will say that there was there was a there was a moment where I wasn't aware of it, where I thought about it was only during the Me Too movement that I had to think about my role as the producer of the festival. Right. Um, because I was always excited to have all of these awesome, great, talented, cool people. And I never gave a thought to um the possibility that I might flirt with someone because yeah. I know me. Yeah. And then when Me Too happened, I was like, oh my God. I suddenly realized regardless, I'm in a position of power and cannot ever do that. That we have to hone our communication skills and 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 be, you know, we have to have that that awareness of our own intent and then the communicative awareness of the perception of others even if that's, even if their perception path is foreign to us, we need to be aware that it could be foreign to us. From your position of privilege, you can work from your understanding of the situation. If you forget that there are other perceptions, you will get into trouble. If I'm doing a scene and I make it an intimate moment and you feel obligated because the rules of improv require a yes and, then I'm an asshole. Or yeah, yeah, that's true. I'm not not so not aware of my surroundings, and I'm definitely not taking care of my scene partner. By the way, I already have one response to the tweet that's about you, but not about you. Oh my god, you put it out. What is it? My friend Ann Herberger, who's amazing. She's one of my favorite people. She hey, said, I was told by a couple of consultants in the 2016 election cycle that I couldn't call a big donor because I wasn't hot enough. <gasps> really? We can protect each other. But I was in this one show and I was the, I was the lead and I was an opera singer and I had two small kids and, and I, an abusive husband. And the last scene of mine was an eight minute monologue where I sang opera, clutched my children to me and then died. <laughs> okay, so it was like a whole terrifying thing. But in the course of this, just before the monologue, my abusive husband grabbed me, kissed me, and bit me in the process of kissing me. That was the that was the scene. And so, and it was an incredibly violently intimate scene yeah. because it 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 wasn't just a quick kiss. It was a, a it was a long right. four or five minute moment. So every night before the show we stood together before the show started and and actually talked to each other like human beings and gave each other permission to do this thing like voice the words i know that in the course of this evening you are going to have to have to you know kiss me and then hurt me in the process and i give you permission to do that and yeah. he would give me permission to to react violently in opposition to this and then after the show the first thing we do when the curtain came down was we'd go right over each other to each other and hug each other oh like no words instantly 
nothing would stop us from that hug moment because that's if healthy. we it was healthy if they we had the reaction like that's good right right it's healthy if we hadn't given the permission and then closed out that moment things would have gotten really really bad for us as individuals and as 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 people that had to interact with each other thing it's not just as artists but i think that as human beings we could give each other permission to have those emotional moments. TJ's heroes. So while I have my heroes in the arts and I have my heroes in the LGBTQ community and I have my heroes in who are just trailblazers in the world, um, there are so many and I have my comedy heroes and my musical theater heroes. Um, right now I would have to say it's it's them it's my parents because they uh they did the best they could with what they were given and better than that you know none of that none of that surprises me in any way knowing you this has been subject to change a sustainability podcast so thank you i'm jody smith sanderson i'm so glad you joined us and pj it was so amazing to make your acquaintance I consider you a lifelong friend now. I hope it's mutual. <laughs> I'll be following you on Twitter, even if it's not. And um, we're so happy to have had you. Thank you so much. It's yeah. it's my pleasure, absolutely. When I have to have the opportunity to have uh, an an in, an intelligent, deep, and grounded conversation with people <laughs> that I adore and people that I am newly adoring, I'm all in. End credits. Interviewee T J Mannix. Interviewers, Jody Smith Anderson and Lauren Stanick. I acknowledge that I am imperfect. And while my, my head is in the right place, I have 52 years of bullshit behind me that prevent me from being as good of a person as I wish I was.